you. Hello and welcome to Mary Live 2.0, Mariology Without Apology. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli. If you were with us for part one, and hopefully you were, uh, because that gives the context for what we're going to talk about today, uh, you'll recall that I promised you that I'd do a long reading to you. Well, I saved that till now because I wanted you to have the context. Again, let me repeat, if this material is used against the council and its authenticity and its, you know, being a true expression of the extraordinary magisterium, uh, that would be a wrong interpretation of what I'm saying and wrong interpretation of the council. But if, once again, it's showing that uh, a protection from error doesn't guarantee the fullest possible presentation of truth and that, you know, human cooperation is necessary for an even greater uh, articulation of truth, that's completely legit. So we talked about in part one how um, the fathers before they came to the council, gave their uh, preferred topics to discuss. Then there were uh, drafts or schemas produced over a period of, of uh, almost three years, coming really up close to the beginning of the first session of the Second Vatican Council. And, and then at the first section of Second, uh, the Second Vatican Council, there was nothing approved. The uh, European Alliance or the Rhineland uh, flowed into the Tiber in a powerful way and uh, many, including at that time, Father Ratzinger, thought that was a great success. Um, he, again, would would change uh, significantly, especially in terms of Our Lady. But we are now in between Session 1 and Session 2. Uh, this is August of 1963, and we're at the Fulda Conference. The Fulda Conference is a conference of German, Austrian, Swiss, and some Scandinavian bishops as a kind of planning session of what they're going to do during the second session. So they took the document on Our Lady, the schema, the draft on Our Lady, which, by the way, had uh, media not only mediatrics of all graces, but also had co-redentrics included in the first draft, and uh, a, a wonderful four-paragraph summary of the history of the title of Mary Co-redemptrix in terms of doctrine and, and previous use under uh, the pontificate of, of Pius X. Um, all that would be removed without the Council Fathers ever seeing it. Uh, that would be removed by a theological preparatory group uh, that were uh, principally of uh, Rhineland persuasion of the European Alliance that saw those types of elements. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more when we talk about co-redemptrics in a later program. But they basically said... Uh, we're going to take co-redemptrics out because it could be um, misunderstood by our separated brethren, our Protestant Christians. Well, just think about using that method, that uh, theological method for presenting Catholic truth. If it could be misunderstood, we remove it. That clearly is a very dangerous and a very unfortunate uh, method. So, but we are now at Fulda at this conference and... Uh, they gave the drafts to Father Karl Rahner, um, and they asked him, and I'm saying they, the, this is the leadership of the European Alliance, uh, principally uh, Cardinal Friends of Cologne and, and the Cardinal uh, of Vienna, as well as the other bishops that are there. And they asked Father Rahner to give his opinions. Um, and here we're going to stick to things strictly and specifically mirological, I want to read to you um, from Wilkin's book. Remember in part when we talked about Wilkin, Father Wilkin, uh, the Rhine flows into the Tiber, uh, arguably the best play-by-play uh, -play commentator what happens at the council. And, and I'm going to read directly from his text so you realize this is as objective as it gets about what happened when these comments uh from, Card, uh, uh, from Father Rahner were then brought to the whole uh, Fulda Conference and then from the Fulda Conference to the General Secretariat uh, before the next session of the Second Vatican Council. If you feel like this is kind of like a, you know, who's on first type of uh, discussion of where things are at, be at peace. Just listen to Father Karl Rahner's critique 
of the first draft that was prepared by members of the Holy Office, now the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, regarding Our Lady. Okay. So, and again, now you can sit back and relax, and I'm going to read a little bit to you. <clears throat> Quote, When the German and Austrian Council Fathers received their copies of the schema on Our Lady, they asked Father Rahner to prepare comments on it for presentation at the forthcoming Fulda Conference. According to Father Rahner, whose written statements were distributed to all the participants in the conference, the schema as then drafted was, quote, a source of the greatest concern for himself and for Fathers Grillmeyer, Sommelroth, and Ratzinger, who had also examined it from a theological point of view. Were the text to be uh, accepted as it stood, he contended, quote, unimaginable harm would result from an ecumenical point of view in relation to both Orientals and Protestants. Orientals would be the Eastern churches. We'd later see that the Easterners were calling for a much more full-blown Mariology than were the Rhineland theologians, were, than, than the European alliance. Uh, it could not be too strongly stressed, he said, this is Rahner, quote, that all the success achieved in the field of ecumenism through the council and in connection with the council will be rendered worthless by the retention of the schema as it stands. Please keep in mind, this was prepared in large part by Father Balich, who was the founder of uh, the, the Marianum and uh, the most prominent Mariologist at the time. So Rahner's critique is a critique of members who did work for the Holy Office. It's not simply a, a separate theological opinion. <clears throat> Going on. It, it would be too much to expect, continued Father Rahner, that the schema on the Blessed Virgin could be rejected as simply as the schema on the sources of divine revelation. It should therefore be urged, quote, with all possible insistence, that the schema on the Blessed Virgin be made either a chapter or an epilogue of the schema on the church. Quote, this would be the easiest way to delete from the schema statements which theologically are not sufficiently developed and which could only do incalculable harm from an ecumenical point of view. It would also prevent bitter discussion. Okay, So, just so we're clear, Rahner is saying because of the, the dangerous material he saw in the first schema, in the first draft, the way to get around that for ecumenical reasons would be not to give Mary a separate document, but rather to have uh, her document included in the document in the church, or, as you heard Rahner say, make it an epilogue, make it an appendix, an afterthought. Okay. So Rahner's clear purpose for doing this is ecumenical harm in, in his perspective. Another very important comment, Father Rahner contended further that the schema as it stood used, quote, tactics which objectively are not honorable. Since, quote, it declares that there is no intention of defining new dogmas and at the same time presents certain teachings as though they already belonged to the doctrine of the church, although they are not yet dogmas and, from a modern theological standpoint, cannot become dogmas. Bear with me. i got to read that to you again. So first of all, Father Rahner is advising the cardinals and bishops, 80, 70 strong, uh, at the Fulda Conference, that there's there's a question of tactics on the part of the Holy Office and on the part of those who drafted this. Um, tactics which objectively are not honorable. Now, why would he say that? That's not just a, a text problem. He's saying there's some manipulation going on, perhaps. Why? Because, quote, it declares that there is no intention of defining new dogmas and at the same time presents certain teachings as though they already belong to the doctrine of the church, although they are not as yet dogmas and, from a modern theological standpoint, cannot become dogmas. Okay, what's he talking about? He's talking about, as he will expand later, uh, the teachings, the doctrinal teachings of Our, Lord, of Our Lady as the Mediatrix of All Graces. My friends, we'll do another program on this, too. Mediatrix of All Graces... Initially, with Pius IX, but very profoundly with Leo XIII, appears in several 
successive papal encyclicals, encyclicals, not just Wednesday audiences. And I, and I mentioned that, not that you shouldn't respect Wednesday audiences, but sometimes, uh, you know, the, the, the contention has been, well, they're, 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 they're marginal. They're just, they're, they're side, they're passing, they're not important. Uh, and it's true, you have to examine the nature of the document in which something is uh, articulated and promulgated by the church to establish uh, the level of faith commitment that we're required to have. That's true. But Rahner is saying that the schema, the first draft, has things that are proposed as, and again, I just want to give it in his words, this is from his document, there's no intention to define new dogmas and at the same time present certain teachings as though they already belong to the doctrine of the church. Because they do. Mediatrics of all graces does belong to the doctrine of the church. There's also been two centuries of the teaching on marrying co-redemption. Um, and the title co-redemptrix had already been used three times by Pius XI. But the doctrine of co-redemption, as again we will talk about in another program, is clear from Pius IX onward. You're talking about 150 years of unbroken papal succession in doctrinal teaching. So Rahner is accusing the people writing the schema, the, the, what would now be the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, for writing the schema, with, with an idea that there was a... Uh, again, I want to be very careful not to... you know, uh, I don't want to use his terms. Uh, tactics which objectively are not honorable because they're including Mary as mediatrix of all graces and co-redemptrix. At the same time, did you hear the last thing he said? Um, uh, sorry, and from a modern theological standpoint, cannot become dogmas. I have to say, according, with all due respect to Father Ronald, according to who? On what basis are you to declare definitively that a, an existing Marian doctrine can never in the future become a dogma. Ironically, both of those seem to be questionable and dubious in terms of statement. Mediatrix of all graces is a doctrine and was contained in the original schema as that, as the mediatrix of all graces, because Pope after Pope after Pope had said so in encyclicals. That's what we know to be ordinary magisterial teaching on a doctrinal level, which is binding. It doesn't have to be a dogma to be a binding. And secondly, his theological prophecy, it could never happen. Okay, uh, so then what happens? And I, I don't want to uh, overread here, but the Folda Conference accepts Father Rahner's uh, analysis entirely. Uh, the only thing that it backs off in saying is Rahner said, don't even use the word, not only don't use mediatrics of all graces, he, also, he said, don't use mediatrics. And, uh, you know, sometimes, my friends, we have to be very careful of saying, well, you know, it, it, it demands further study. Look, anything can, can call for further study. St. Maximian Kolbe did his untold contribution to Mariology 50 years after the definition of the Immaculate Conception. So even a dogma can receive further study, further illumination, as long as it stays within the parameters of what's being defined. Uh, and, and so... It appears to be a bit of an ad, uh, uh, ad uh, kind of a, a fallacious misdirecting, a, a little bit of a red herring, to say, well, these are these these things haven't been developed enough. Uh, well, they're developed enough to have a, a, an appearance repeatedly in in papal encyclicals. So essentially, what happens? The Folda Conference adopts it, except they do not categorically rule out just the term mediatrics because they think. It won't be accepted uh, at Rome. What then happens, we go back to the Vatican. You now have uh, the, the second session of Vatican's II starting. And during the first session where the discussion of the, the treatment of Our Lady is brought up, the Cardinal from Cologne raises uh, to the letter the desires of Father Rahner, and says we've got 70-plus uh, bishops from, again, the Rhineland countries that support this, saying we don't want a separate document on Mary. Uh, and, and therefore, he, from the beginning, says, let's put her as a chapter in the document on the church. 
what I think is important historically is to realize is regardless of how some of the fathers voted, the intention of Father Rahner was precisely to underplay Our Lady for ecumenical reasons, uh, because he's talking about a doctrine, a repeated perennial doctrine of the Church taught for, for re really over two centuries in the papal magisterium. Okay, so then it commences with a discussion uh, about the pros and cons of a separate document. And again, uh, I, I encourage you to get Father Wilkins' a book and read it for yourself because he, he summarizes the different backs and forths. Um, I mean, one example is, for example, uh, uh, Benjamin Cardinal de Arriba y Castro of Tarragona from Spain took the floor on behalf of 60 bishops, most of them from Spain. Quote, he argues that contrary to what had been suggested at previous meetings, it would be preferable to adopt a separate schema on the Blessed Virgin because of the importance of the Mother of God in the economy of redemption. So many fathers saw the move for a just including Our Lady in the document on the church. And, and by the way, there can be secondary uh, benefits to having also a treatment of Our Lady in the church. Of course, that's, that's a positive, but it doesn't have to be either or. And I just want to mention that Bishop Wojtyla, uh, the soon-to-be John Paul II, his opinion was give Our Lady a separate document because she deserves that attention by the faithful. If not, if that's not granted, make sure that Our Lady gets the second chapter in the document on the church so that she can be seen in union with Jesus. Remember what we talked about in, in part one? Christotypical Mariology. You always have to ask first, how is Mary in relation to Jesus? Then, how is she in relation to us? And it's very clear that the mind of Wojtyla, the future John Paul II, was give her her own document because she deserves that attention. She de deserves that, um, that theological appreciation. If that doesn't go through, make sure it's chapter two. Of course, neither one of those things uh, would transpire. So there's, there's exchange, it goes back and forth. Um, I just want to read you, and of course, you will also see the exchanges of the Rhineland uh, uh, bishops and cardinals saying she shouldn't have her own document, and they're, they're basically, uh, in various forms, simply uh, restating what Cardinal, uh, what, excuse me, what Father Karl Rahner stated. Too much emphasis, ecumenical danger, uh, saying John... The 23rd called this for ecumenical reasons, which again, as we talked about in the first section, is entirely accurate. He called it first for precision of doctrine in its fullest for today, as well as, and of course, look at a guy like John Paul II, my friends. Can you can you come up, can you even imagine a more Marian Pope? But at the same time, can you imagine a more ecumenical Pope? No one did more for ecumenism than St. John Paul II, and everybody granted it. So it's not an either or, you know, Catholics uh, are really called to be both and people, right? Uh, grace and, and, and free will, uh, uh, scripture and tradition, faith and works. And it's really uh, a both and uh, in terms of Our Lady. Uh. So anyway, it finally gets down to a final presentation. You have the Cardinal from the Philippines, Cardinal Santos, say, please wait. Please don't vote on this until we have more time to examine the importance of a separate schema, a separate draft on Our Lady. And then Cardinal uh, Koenig of Vienna, uh, one of the three leaders of the Rhineland, uh, the European Alliance, said, uh, let's go forward with a separate document again, articulating Karl Rahner's reasons. So let me just read to you the end, what takes place. On October 29th, a vote was taken on the following statement. Does it please the Council Fathers that the schema on the Blessed Virgin Mary Mother of the Church, should be arranged that it may become chapter 6 of the Schema on the Church. When the votes were counted, there were 1,114 in favor of combining the two schemas, essentially putting Mary in a chapter in the Church. Uh, the required majority was only 1,097. Father Rahner and the European Alliance had won by a margin of 17 votes. And that again as I mentioned in the first part, led several fathers to leave uh, the Basilica in tears. 
because they they saw this um, as an effort to downplay Our Lady. Now, once again, and, and, and bear with me with these comments because it's so important we keep context. Could individual bishops have voted for it because they weren't trying to do it for ecumenical reasons? They just thought it would be nice to have a section of Mary uh, in the church. Of course, that's possible. I think sometimes, though, we have to remember, as we'll talk about with the title Mother of the Church, Mary's yes precedes the church. See, if we get no yes from Mary, guess what? We get no Jesus. We get no Jesus, we get no church. So you can't just put Mary as a member of the church without being mother of the church who comes before. And we'll talk about that um, with, with the next uh with, with the third element. Okay, so number one, remember the three big controversies. Her own document or a document in the church. Number two, what about um, what's in that document once it becomes a, a chapter in the church? Uh, and the instructions were, excuse me, very clearly, don't change anything in terms of content. All The only editorial changes can be the introduction and conclusion that would make it fit as a chapter, uh, as, a, as a, a segment on the chapter on the church rather than its own document. So the, the changes were just supposed to be editorial, and that time it was going to be, you know, uh, chapter six. Well, the second great controversy happens uh, when they examine, and this is a, a, this is the, the next session now, uh, when they examine. Okay, let's. What are we going to prove as the actual text that goes in there? Well, I'm going to summarize a lot. Get Father uh, Wilkin, and you can read the, the play by play, and it's and it's fascinating. Essentially, this is what happens. This is what happens. Uh, you get two experts, two parentists. One is uh, Father Balich, who again was the principal Mariologist of the time, and, and very strongly a, a, a Tiber theologian, if you will. A very strong on co-redemption, uh, and he is paired with Monsignor Phillips, who is a French theologian who is very much on the Rhineland side, uh, and uh, made references that he didn't want mediatrics in there at all. So the two of them are supposed to come up with a compromise text, not an easy task, but in fact, what the Council Fathers were told was, no, it would just be editorial changes not really content changes, but in fact, there would be significant content changes. How do we know? Because we have the first draft. We have the first schema. You can look it up, and then you can compare it to what became Lumen Gentium chapter 8, and there are significant content changes. Now, before you make a conclusion about the overall effect of how Our Lady has treated the Council, hold off on that, because I, I want to read an important comment on, on that as well. So, so what takes place? Again, you have debate. Um, there is a strong uh, Rhineland uh, position to eliminate mediatrics of all graces, and uh, with most to, to eliminate mediatrics at all. So they're, they're, they're really following what Father Rahner had said back, back in the Fulda conference, which is, of course, was not at Second Vatican Council in between the sessions. So that continues, and you get, you know, people, I'm standing up and speaking for 60 bishops on one hand, 60 bishops on the other hand. Um, and what then goes on is you have a couple bishops, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to take the time and read this to you, because you have a couple bishops saying, now, now wait a minute, this, this is just going a bit too far in terms of what the fathers were promised when they accepted putting the section on Our Lady within the church versus uh, what came forward. Uh, and, I, and let me just give you one example. Meanwhile, uh, let me also say on a positive note, while this debate's going on, the Polish bishops under Cardinal Wyszynski is asking and petitioning now Pope Paul VI because Pope John died and Pope uh, Paul VI is elected. They're petitioning the Holy Father for the title Mother of the Church. Uh, all 70 Polish bishops, I mean, the Polish force of Vatican II, in, in my mind, was, was really life-saving. It was, it was Mary-saving in terms of 
their unified effort to try to present the full truth about Our Lady. Uh, so that's going on too during this discussion. Let me just read uh, two excerpts about cardinals or bishops going forward and saying in front of the whole body, this isn't what we bargained for. Okay, so first of all, uh, Cardinal Ruffini of Palermo said that the schema, quote, almost veiled the cooperation of Mary in the work of redemption, which had been willed by God. And since the text also contained the unqualified statement that Mediatrix was a title given to the Blessed Virgin, it was necessary to explain clearly what this title meant, so that non-Catholics will come to realize that the use of this title implies no lessening of the dignity of Christ, who is the absolutely necessary mediator. Uh, and then I mentioned, uh, again, uh, what Cardinal Wyszynski and the Polish uh, bishops are coming forward. You'll then have a long statement uh, by Cardinal Leger of, of Montreal saying, no, uh, we got to keep things sober. That was the word he used, sober regarding Mary. And we'll give her too much attention uh, if, we, if we make reference to mediatrics of all graces, uh, even though, again, it had been the repeated teaching, official doctrinal teaching of the Magisterium, not just a theological opinion. Uh, Cardinal Bea, who was head of the scripture, uh, he was head of the uh, Commission for Promoting Christian Unity, uh, literally said a council was not intended uh, as a manual for personal devotion, which would indicate in his mind that the doctrine of Mary, who mediates the Redeemer to humanity, uh, and then subsequently after participating in the acquisition of grace, then distributes the graces of the redemption, uh, that that's just kind of a personal devotional thing. Uh, I, I would just have to strongly disagree with that. Uh, I'm just going to read one extended commentary. And by the way, in between the second and third sessions, once again, the uh, European Alliance or, uh, Alliance or um, sorry, uh, the, the Rhineland bishops will meet in Innsbruck in May. They'll do it again. This is in May of 1964. And again, now they have Germany and Austria and Switzerland, uh, some of France and almost all of the Scandinavian and some representation from, uh, from the British Isles. So that's a big block that comes together that you know, kind of predetermines what they want to have happen regarding the scam on Our Lady before the Council Fathers uh, all get there. Okay, this is Archbishop Corrado Mingo of Monreal, Italy. He severely criticized the text. Now, again, this is the new compromise text. Contrary to what had been promised in the Council Hall, the text had been, quote, absolutely and radically mutilated in the process of being turned into a chapter of the scam on the Church. The title, Mother of the Church, had been deleted without any justification whatsoever, he said, contrary to the wish expressed by Pope Paul in his discourse of October 11, 1963, in the Basilica of St. Mary Majors. Not only should the title Mediatrix be retained in the text, he said, but it should be amplified to read Mediatrix of all graces. So again, a, a lot of back and forth with this. Y um, I've got to bring us to the conclusion because, again, we can go endlessly with this. Um, eventually, uh, Cardinal Roy from Montreal, um, oh, excuse me, from, from Canada, also said uh, that we have to do an up and down vote on the whole thing. You can't make individual changes anymore. So that gave the fathers the choice of either starting over or just kind of swallowing what a number of them had as, as particular objections regarding things like including mediatrics of all graces, um, not even including the co-redemptrix, which had already been eliminated by a theological commission. So, on November 18th, the text as revised in light of the qualifications submitted by the 521 Council Fathers was put again to a vote. When the assembly was asked if it was satisfied with the manner in which the qualifications had been handled, 99% said yes. Now, I, I do, and, and so, what we now have as chapter 8, um, the, the, the chapter on Our Lady within the Second Vatican Council was uh, agreed upon. And, and I, I, again, I go and look, total freedom, I mean, within the parameters of the church, of course, 
one could say, oh, I think it went exactly as it was supposed to. I personally don't agree with that. Uh, I, 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 of course, will always defend, and um, I'm going to read to you a, a fascinating Protestant quote about the final document, uh, but I think the process was um, overhandedly uh, focusing on ecumenism rather than John the 23rd's purpose for calling the council, and that is precision of faith in its fullness in a new uh, expressed way. So uh, let, let me read to you uh, this, this last comment. Uh, if, you, if you get a chance to take a look at the further text, there's one bishop from Italy who just gets on the floor just in frustration and says, are we here first? For our separated brethren, or we are here first to identify and to promulgate in a new way what we believe as Catholics. So there was a lot of emotion regarding uh, this process. But after the text is completed, and sorry, one other uh, postscript, you might think so many tangents, but you have no idea how many I'm suppressing in terms of there's, there's so much to what happened at the council. Um, the 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 in Lumen Gentium 62, it says, you know, she, she may be rightly called as advocate, benefactress, and, and, the, and the, the fourth term is mediatrix, helper and mediatrix. Well, those other three were put in purposely to try to downplay uh, the mediatrix. So it went from mediatrix of all graces and co-redemptrix in the first schema to mediatrix to mediatrix being the fourth title so that it wouldn't be too prominent. And that, again, happened through the theological uh, commissions, a group of Peretti, a group of experts who would be drafting this and writing this. And uh, those commissions, it's simply a, a point of fact, as Father Wilkin puts out, were strongly in the majority of the Rhineland theologians and the Rhineland bishops. Now, this is a professor, this is a Protestant invited guest. I, I want you to really hear what he has to say about the outcome, what we now have as Lumen Gentium chapter 8, because even after all we talked about, there is more on Our Lady, more beautiful truth on Our Lady from Vatican II than any of the other councils. One could argue even the other councils put together. Um, there's so much that is uh, still a, a continuity from the past, even though uh, it's fair to have the opinion that had the ecumenical element not been such a high priority, there could have been a more complete doctrine, which again, the fathers say in number 54, they're not offering. They, 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 they're saying chapter 8, a Lumen Gentium, does not offer complete treatment on the doctrine of merit. That's an odd thing uh, for a council as well. All right, this is Professor uh, Oscar Coleman, and uh, let me just read it to you. A guest of the Secretariat for Promoting Christian Unity. Protestant theologian, gave a lengthy uh, press a, a conference address at the end of the council, in the course of which he said, quote, We cannot pass over in silence the disappointment that we experienced at seeing the title Mediatrix given to Mary. The fact that the text on Mary, after so much discussion as to where it should be placed, should have finally become the concluding chapter of the schema on the church a decision which was in fact intended to weaken Mariology, has in reality made it even stronger, because everything stated about the Church now culminates, so to speak, in this chapter. He went on to observe that in light of the many ceremonies honoring Mary during the Council, and also of the statements made about her by both Pope John and Pope Paul, it must be concluded, quote, that Mariology at this council has in general been intensified to a degree which is not in keeping with the ecumenical tendencies of Protestantism, as it should be. That's my part, not his. And with a return to the Bible, our expectation in this connection have not been fulfilled. It was clear, he said, that we could not require the surrender of a teaching and tradition which belongs to the very kernel of Catholic piety, what he had expected, however, was a weakening of emphasis, not some sort of revision of the fundamental relationship to the Virgin Mary. So here we have one of the leading Protestant guests saying, 
it's so disappointing that in light of all this, and of course, he's from Germany as a Protestant uh, kind of guest apparatus, guest expert. He's saying, after all of this, Mariology is intensified. There's a real truth to what he is saying. And I, and I believe, I believe, that's the operation of the Holy Spirit, that in, in, in light of um, human goals, which I would personally disagree with in terms of a hierarchy of values, putting the ecumenical higher, really, than ongoing magisterial doctrine and developing that in a beautiful way, it can still be very ecumenically stated without compromise. Compromise is for Congress. Compromise is not for the Holy Office, the CDF, or ecumenical councils. It, it, it's, a, it's the best articulation of the full truth that we have. So I think that Coleman was right, that in spite of all these efforts, there was a beauty uh, and, and, a, and, and a, a, a relative completeness, not a full completeness, that was really very extraordinary. All right, very briefly on the last elements, um, Pope Paul VI. So we're at November 21st, 1964. It's at the close of uh, that third session. If you do other reading, you'll see it was called Black Week because, in fact, on many separate occasions, Paul VI had to intervene against the European alliance, so-called, against the Rhineland theologians and bishops because they were simply going too far. One area was collegiality, for example. So it talks about how the Pope comes in to uh, to offer Mass at the close of this third session, and he's met with stony-faced uh, bishops, as, as Wilkin reminds us, and, and other journalistic testimonies to what happens. And uh, the, the journalists don't know what to make of this, but they're not clapping for the Pope. They're not greeting for the Pope. They're upset. Why? Because the Pope corrected them several times during that last week because they were going too far. And I want to be careful about this, but let me just say we can see at least similar tendencies in what's happening in the church in Germany right now. It's going too far. So back to November 21st, 1964, the Holy Father, to the surprise of many, although the, the question is why it was a, a surprise, he announced it three days earlier, it was just ignored, and in fact, he had mentioned it at the close of the second session that he wanted the council fathers to declare Mary as mother of the church. Well, guess what? They didn't do it because the European alliance got stronger and stronger. So to the shock of many of the European alliance members, Paul VI ends that session on November 21st, uh, uh, 1964, by proclaiming Mary as mother of the church. Fulton Sheen, who was there, said, there's never been a longer standing ovation in the history of St. Peter's Basilica than after Paul VI took his papal prerogative and crowned Our Lady as the mother of the church. Uh, he also made reference of uh, sending a golden rose to Fatima because he'd received so many petitions. Well, the back side on that is 510 uh, ordinaries of, of diocese had asked the Pope at, uh, at Vatican II to consecrate the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary to fulfill the Fatima request. And on this note, the Pope uh, chose rather to show, uh, he made a reference of an entrustment, but he sent a golden rose to Fatima. So that comes forward in a, in a, in a beautiful um crescendo for Our Lady, that she's declared the mother of the church. And if you understand that title properly, uh, you understand that within that, you do have her roles as co-redemptrix and mediatrix and advocate, because she's only mother, because she particip participates with the son first uh, as mother and in the work of redemption. Uh, one quick postscript, why was there such a battle against mother of the church? Because the major Rhineland theologians, including Father Laurentin and, uh, and Kostner and, and Rahner, certainly, and Semmelroth, said, no, you can't call her mother of the church. She's daughter of the church. She's just one of us. Don't If you call her mother, it gives the indication that in some ways, she's beyond us. Bingo. In some ways, the mother of Jesus, praise be to God, is beyond us. Because we're not immaculately conceived. Uh, 
We're not perpetually uh, uh, virginal after having given birth to Jesus. No, none of us can put our hand up and say, yeah, I actually, I gave words to the flesh. I, I did it just the other day. Uh, or none of us are assumed into heaven, let alone her saving role to bring us the graces of salvation. So Mary is mother of the church, and that is a rich title. Don't let that title be downgraded to simply saying, well, she's just a member. She's mother and mysteriously the first member at the same time. Her yes allows Jesus. Her, less, her yes allows the church. Okay, so I hope that's helpful, uh, even though there, there's so many different aspects of Our Lady at the Council. Like I said, I could do a whole semester on that. But I hope it gives you the overall sense that, A, the Holy Spirit did act at the Council and protected from error. B, everything in Lumen Gentium, chapter 8, is true. And C, as the Council itself says, it's open for a greater theological and mariological develop development. And that includes, my friends, the possibility of a fifth Marian dogma. All right. Thanks for being with us. Mary Live, Mariology without apology. God bless you all.